So we're going to take this moment, just the first part of the um, webinar today, to say hello to everyone. And this is to the come to the uh, end of our third day of our talks. I'm losing track because we've had talks going on all week. But the end of our third day and the sixth talk of the week, which is uh, fantastic. Um, some of you will be in the morning, so good morning. Otherwise, the end of the day in the UK or may, wherever else you are in the world, because we've had lots of people joining us from all over this week. Um, we've got Margie Turin from the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. It's a bit of a long mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, uh, you would just would you just say Lamont Doherty, Margie. Lamont that Doherty, you absolutely. And uh, she's the director of educational field programs there, and combines her background in ecology and education. And uh, was going to give us a, a hopefully a really fantastic talk today about all the wildlife that she met face to face in Antarctica. Um, and she'll talk for about half an hour. The webinar in total will go on uh, for an hour maximum and we'll have questions after she's finished her talk. I'm sure we will have many, many questions about all the wildlife in Antarctica. So I'm sorry if we don't get through them all. But please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll try and get through as many as we can. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to you, Maggie. Okay, that sounds great. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, start my slideshow which hopefully you can see now. Um, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm really excited for us to spend a little bit of time in Antarctica today. Um, I said, grab your cameras and binoculars and let's go along. Antarctica is very wild. It's an incredible space and I hope that you enjoy exploring it with me. Um, this is part of the International Thwaites Glacier Collaborative, which is a partnership program between the United States and the United Kingdom, where we're really focusing on getting a better understanding of one particular part of uh, Antarctica itself. And I'll show that to you when we jump into a map. But just so you know a little bit about me, I have spent um, time in both Antarctica and the Arctic, um, primarily in Greenland and the Arctic. Both are amazing spaces and I really look forward to sharing some about Antarctica with you today. So one thing that I think is really important for us to spend a minute on is understanding that Antarctica itself has been set aside for science. That cannot be said about anywhere else on earth. It is a continent that is exclusively about science. It's managed by a treaty. And that treaty puts a lot of protections on the wildlife as well as everything else, but the wildlife is protected. And I think that that's really critically important. Um, it allows us to understand the wildlife, but there is this strong uh, responsibility not to interfere with the wildlife. We wanna understand it as it works, as it's operating in um, its natural environment. You can see all these wonderful flags. These are groups that are part of this Antarctic Treaty. It started with just about a dozen countries and has grown through the years. And it really is amazing. And in fact, there are areas that are set up as no-fly zones. If you're um, using an aircraft to do science or to come in or out of the continent, you have to avoid certain areas. Um, and some of that is protections for uh, penguin colonies in different areas. They wanna make sure that you're not disturbing the wildlife. So something really nice to think about. So Antarctica is really extreme and it's hard to even imagine it if you haven't been there, but we're just gonna kind of put our minds into the space that we're gonna be traveling to. It is the coldest place on earth. It's the driest place on earth. And I know that seems kind of odd because there's so much snow and ice there, but that's been accumulating over really millions of years. So it is very dry there. It's the highest, so the ice is stacked so high that it's higher than anywhere else on Earth. It's the windiest, very empty. It's, it's really, really um, not a friendly place in terms of trying to think about what could possibly live there. It is not an environment where there's a, a very comfortable space for wildlife to just sit back and thrive. So to kind of zoom in a little bit more on the continent, Antarctica is broken into two specific areas. There's West Antarctica and there's East Antarctica. East Antarctica is much bigger. Um, it's covered in ice, ice that's several miles, like three miles or five kilometers thick. Whereas West Antarctica is less thick ice, 
um, much smaller in size. And look, you can see this brown area is where you see the rock and the land coming through the ice. But if you just take a look at the entire of Antarctica, you realize there is not that much exposed rock. There's not that much area for our wildlife to really thrive. So if you think about what are they gonna eat, where are they gonna live, boy, there's not a lot of options, which means that all of our wildlife is focused around the edges of the continent. And frankly, a lot of it is focused on the ocean. And so to give you a sense of what it might be like to eke out a living on the edges of the continent, I want you to just take a look at this picture that I grabbed when I was down there. So here's, here's that rocky stuff that I showed you in that last map. But wow, it's still covered in just dripping layers of frozen ice. It's just like hanging over the edges. So in terms of thinking about where am I going to go for food, of course, the ocean is where you would spend most of your time. So you'll see that there really aren't any terrestrial land animals. We wouldn't be able to have a talk if I was going to focus on that because there aren't any. It's really all about our marine life. It's about those species that spend their time primarily in the water, with a little bit of time on land. And so that's where we're going to focus today. Um, so I'll start by talking about a couple of really interesting birds. Um, these are Cape petrels. Um, and I want to call your attention to the coloring of a lot of the um, animals that we're going to look at today. So you're going to see this white and black as a very consistent thread in the coloring today. And I want you to think about that. Why would that be an interesting color or you, a color that was really dominant in Antarctica? And we'll try and answer that through the course of the top talk. But um, the Cape petrel are, are really kind of fascinating. Um, they, this particular group was chasing along behind our ship. And they love to do that because the ship will churn up the water behind it. And of course, there are little things that live in the water that come up behind the ship. And so they swoop down and they have a good dinner by following us around. Um, but they have a couple of cool adaptations. So first of all, in Antarctica, everything's adapted to be there. It has unique features, abilities in order to be part of that ecosystem. And so um, a couple of things about this particular bird. Um, one thing that it does is it has this oil in its stomach that it can shoot out its mouth um, to avoid predators as well as to fight with other uh, birds over prey. So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Can you imagine if you rocked around and suddenly shot this horrible stomach oil out of your mouth if you were going <laughs> off in search of lunch? That's kind of what they do. Um, and the other thing that they do, which is kind of interesting, is because they spend so much time on the ocean around the salt water, they build up a lot of salt in their systems. And so they have these little salt glands that are above their beaks that they use to get rid of that extra salt. So kind of a cool thing to think about as a feature. Um, and this second seabird that I wanted to point out is the Antarctic skua. And this is a very ferocious predator. This bird is very aggressive. Um, it will go after other birds to capture their prey, their food, so that it it's kind of piggybacks on what they've already hunted. Um, and in addition, it likes to kind of hang out by penguins because um, it is very fond of penguin eggs and young penguin chicks. Now, we might think of that as being really awful, that it's Predating, predating on these, you know, other little innocent animals. But in Antarctica, you're going to find that it's all about looking for your own meal and avoiding being somebody else's meal. So it's really about making sure you fill your own stomach and you don't fill somebody else's stomach. These guys, by the way, will chase after people if they get too close and they'll swoop down and hit them with their wings. Um, they make a lot of noise. If you've spent time in Antarctica, especially on the peninsula, you've run into a skua, they're not my favorite bird. They're pretty aggressive and can be very in your face, so to speak. And here's a little evidence that's been left behind. Um, so notice if you look up here in the ice, you can see these little prints. Those would be, of course, penguin footprints. And here we see an egg that has been ravished my bet would be on a skua. That probably was skua's lunch or dinner. 
Okay, so as long as we've introduced the penguin egg, let's go ahead and introduce some of my favorite things in Antarctica. I'm going to focus on four species of penguin, um, and these are the four, the emperor, the Adeli, the chinstrap, and the gentoo. And of these four penguins, the emperor and the Adeli are two that the only two penguins that actually spend their entire lives in Antarctica. They're the ones that call Antarctica home. And this map is showing you where their colonies are. So if we look at the emperor penguin, you can see that they actually are very well distributed around the edges of Antarctica. They are really well situated to being around the edges and really no area is off limits for them. Um, the second one, the Adeli, you can see that they're also pretty well distributed, but we don't find them up in the Waddell Sea area, um, but we do see them around the rest. And you can see they also have some very large colonies. So the circle size tells you about the size of their colonies. And it's interesting that we don't see those massive sizes in the emperor penguins, just the wider distribution. And then we're going to go to two penguin that really live elsewhere but come into Antarctica to breed in the Antarctic summers. And so that would be our chin strap, which are this light blue color. And you'll see they're only in this peninsula area, which is where we find most of our wildlife. Um, and the gentoo, and they're only in very smaller numbers up here in the peninsula area. Um, so they each have a space in terms of um, specifics about these particular penguins. The emperor penguin, of course, I expect some of you are pretty familiar with them. There have been a lot of movies made about them. They are our largest penguin, quite large, as big as a small child. Um, the Adeli penguins are our smallest penguins, um, and they have a unique coloring. They have an all black head, top, and whites around their eyes. I think of them as being very, very cute. Um, but, you know, everybody has their own favorite penguin, right? Um, the chin strap have this wonderful little helmet strap underneath uh, their faces and their beaks and face are, are a little bit more elongated. And then the Gen 2 has this white band that goes across its, um, behind its eyes, across its ear area. Um, and we're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about penguins and how they manage to live in Antarctica. So I said every animal has an adaptation or an ability to be there. So one of the cool things about penguins is how they stay warm. So let's kind of think about, and I know actually a couple of you sent questions in and had asked about some of these adaptations as to how these species stay warm. So let's kind of tick in and talk about it. So this is a really interesting image. This is taken by a camera that looks at heat. So it's a heat seeking camera and uh, called infrared. And basically what it's looking at is um, the outside of the penguin is actually very cold. So one of the adaptations penguins have is that they pull their heat inside and they use the outside as a method of radiative cooling. So they keep the outside cold, sometimes colder than the exterior air, but the inside is warm. And you can see that by going right up to their eyes and you can see that white and that matches the very warmest temperatures on this scale, which are 10 degrees C or 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a pretty nice warm temperature. But you can see as we go to their exterior, we're all the way down to these negative numbers, negative 40 C or negative 40 Fahrenheit, which are the same actually. So you can see that this kind of technique really helps to keep their interiors warm without them losing a lot of extra energy. Another kind of cool adaptation they have is that they have a layer of fat that's in their interior. So right around their edges, underneath their feathers, they have this nice fat layer. And that works really well when they're in the water. And of course, they spend a fair amount of time in the water. But that doesn't help them much when they get onto land. So what helps them on land is this very interesting kind of dual layering of feathering. This is a cool look at the feathering. Others. And you can see they're very tight together and they have this very fine fluff around the bases. And I actually have a more up close and personal look at that. So you can see all those very, very, very fine little hairs. Those all knit together to kind of help keep out the cold, which is a really important adaptation for this um, particular species. 
Another thing that they do is that they move, they look for wind breaks. So they move out of the wind. And I want you to take a look at this picture and see if you can count how many penguins are in this picture because they kind of blend into the background, don't they? So the background itself is a very specific black and white and you can see the penguins. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you see that one's got its head kind of tucked under its wing, which is something they do when they're cold. But look at that wonderful coloring and how it blends against the background. So again, their color blends right in. It's kind of hides them, um, blocks them, um, but they use this protection behind this uh, kind of barrier to protect from the wind. And then of course, the other thing they do to protect from the wind is that they cuddle together. So this again is another storm that came in. Um, we get these incredible winds in Antarctica that are called catabatic winds. You get them in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. And they're when the wind swoops down off the top of the ice sheet. And so it's bringing this very cold air just swooping down and brings a storm with it. And that, those catabatic winds can be ferocious. And so um, these guys have managed to gather around the flagpole and hang out there. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how they stay warm, but how do they move around? So we know that um, they move between land and water. And so they do um, move around on the land. They kind of waddle around, I guess I would say. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is I want you to look at these feet and something that I didn't mention when we were talking about how they stay warm is that they have this cool mechanism where they stop the blood flow, uh, they stop the warm blood flow into their feet. So they have a, a kind of a barrier cooling that, that cools the blood temperature as it moves into their feet and moves it, um, warms it as it goes back up so that their feet are not actually losing heat. Um, the way that they might be because they don't have feathers or anything on them to protect them. So that's kind of cool. And the other thing they can do is that they can rock back on their feet. And so their toes are not in contact. So it's just their heels that are in contact. So they minimize that contact with the ice underneath them. And for that, they use their tails as kind of a way to balance themselves. So again, you know, they're very clever in terms of adaptations that nature has given them so that they can um, adjust to their particular environment. So let's see how they get around. So let's see if I can find my mouse and get us moving here. All right, so penguins do like to travel in groups. Look at this little group kind of tottering along. So they move kind of step hop, step hop along the edge of the ice as they're moving back from the edge of the water. Um, they strut and hop and this little guy is doing what I call the little penguin hop. They're kind of fun to follow around and, and see what they're doing. Um, and, you know, they also kind of travel well away from the edge of the water, which I always thought was kind of odd. You, you might wonder why a group of penguin might strut all their way up this large hill. Seems like quite a bit of effort for a, a little group of penguins, um, but we'll kind of do some further exploring. So, here is a penguin footprint. Again, you could use your evidence to see a penguin. And you can see over here that there are a lot of penguin footprints, but that is odd. What is that very strange, flat, kind of smooth area that's running through the middle? Now, if that was in my neighborhood, I would think that maybe somebody had drug a sled or pulled something behind them to get that weird kind of smooth area in the ice or snow. Let's see what a penguin might do to make that same thing, that shape. They slip and slide. They love to walk along and then they throw themselves on their bellies and they slide along. It's a very efficient way for them to get across the ice. They'll run around a little bit, then they'll hop on their bellies and slide for a little while, hop back up, run a little bit, slide on their bellies. It's really kind of fun. Um, we want to, it, it looks as if they're just doing it for fun. I'm sure that they have a, a bigger purpose in mind, but it is kind of hilarious. And we'll take a closer look at uh, this little guy. So you can see that wonderful run that he's done on his belly down to the water. But once you do that run down to the water, you have to get back up again, right? 
So this is going to be a long, slow climb back up the hill. And again, it makes you wonder, why do they do that? Like, why would they go so far away to get um, up to the top of a hill? I don't know the answer to that. So maybe some, somebody is researching that somewhere. Um, but we do know they love to be in the water, by the water. They are at their best in the water. So while this to us might look as if he's contemplating, do I really want to jump? That looks very cold. For them, this is just what they do naturally. They go up to the edge, they flop right in, and then they'll do a wonderful deep dive from there. So they're just really ready to go in and explore and look for some food. So this is where they find their meals. There isn't anything on that rocky cliff that they're gonna be interested in. They really need to get into the water and look for fish, squid, and krill. We'll talk about krill in a little bit, but that's their mainstay really anxious to get some of that. So this is our first poll, Sarah. Um, so we're looking at these, these different penguin. And I want to ask you, what did one penguin say to the other penguin? Sarah's going to pop up this poll. So are they saying after you? No, really after you. Or I give that dive a perfect 10 out of 10. Last one ends a tardy penguin. Or did you say dinner time? What do you guys think? Or how are you going to vote? And while you guys are doing that, I'm gonna give a shout out. There were um, a couple of classes from South End Junior School who had sent in a request for us to give a shout out. So the Aristotle class, the Einstein class, and the Galileo class, um, we're giving them a, a big shout out and thanks for joining us. That's awesome. So how are we doing, Sarah? We're good. I think we'll give them a couple more 10 seconds or so just to see if people still want to vote. And see okay. What, see what the most popular answer was going to be. Okay. Yes. There's certainly no right or wrong answer here. No, exactly. <laughs> this is just for fun. <laughs> here we go. I'll end it now. Okay. And there you go. You can see that. All results. right. Did you say dinner time? And I think that's probably the right answer, to be honest, if we were really going to stand back and think about it. Although I am going to float another hypothesis for you. So, as scientists, we always want to have a hypothesis. So what might be really happening here? And I want to point out to you guys the differences in these little penguins. So first of all, check out the heads on these guys. And maybe you'll remember what penguin has an all black head and just has the white eyes. That's an Adeli. And then I want you to take a peek at this little guy down here. And oh, look at that. He's got that white band behind his um, ears or his eyes. And that would be a Gen 2 penguin. And so maybe the, they're saying, hey, we have this iceberg. You guys, you better get out of here. Who knows? We'll never know. It's, it's all in the penguin language, I suppose. But thank you, guys. That was awesome. And I've lost my mouse again. Here we go. Um, but one thing we do know is that they're very efficient in the water. Look at these guys. They look like dancers, don't they? They can dive way down and they can come back up and they're very efficient at fishing and hunting in the water. So this is really where they'd rather be, much rather be in the water than on land, although they are a, a, a land-based mammal. Okay, marine one. Um, all right, so penguin life cycle. That's the next thing we're gonna look at. And these are the, again, these Gen 2 penguins that have the white behind their eyes. Um, and you'll see it looks as if they're almost like kissing with their beaks. And they actually do have this really interesting mating ritual where they strut along, they come over to each other, and then they tend to take their beaks and their heads and they almost make a heart shape by going down together and talking to each other and then tipping their heads back again. And they end up with their beaks beak to beak um, it, it's a really a, a very a kind of endearing looking mating ritual um, and they you know will separate off then and uh, become partners and their nesting this doesn't look much like the nests that we're used to seeing it's done in rock nests which seems very unappealing um, but it is their favorite place to to be to hang out um, and you'll see that there are long rows of them that take advantage of the rocky outcrops. You see, there's an awful lot of ice around here and they'll ju you'll just find nest after nest. And, I, and on this backside, you'll see the same thing, nest after nest. Um, and they're very territorial, even though they're side by side. So these guys are 
calling out and saying, hey, hey, this is my space. This is going to be my, my nest, my partner. So um, again, uh, really kind of interesting. And then they'll hunker down. And um, I want to show you just stepping back. This whole row is just filled with penguins um, and they're all nesting. So again, once it's the right time of year, the nesting season happens, they're going to jump in there and they're going to um, build their nests and do get down to business. Um, the seasons are very short and everything is very focused in Antarctica. So their mission is to actually create, you know, have some chicks and, and build an, a new crop of Gen 2 penguins. So in here we see one of the eggs that, that was uh, hatched. Um, and so now they're hatched, now they need to be fed. So again, you know, back to the water again. So that's where they're gonna go for their food. Um, you probably are familiar with the fact that the um, emperor penguins, the males, um, take care of the eggs. Um, that is only exclusively, that is only true for the emperors. The others share that duty. So the females might spend time with the egg, the males might spend time with the egg. But then they'll go off and they'll gather some food and there's kind of three different ways that they can feed their um, young chicks. They can fully digest that food and then they can regurgitate it and kind of like a gruel. Um, or they can, uh, for a younger bird, they could actually um, digest it almost to a milk and kind of scoot it back out as, as a milk. Um, or a third way is that they can swallow like a fish whole and almost just hold it as like their tummy becomes a refrigerator and then they pop that whole fish back up. So it's kind of interesting um, and uh, a very unique um, method, which again, works very well in this environment for the different stages of our, our penguin growth. All right, we talked about the fact that we've seen a lot of black and white and there is a lot of black and white in Antarctica, very little color. Um, why do you think black and white? What's so special about black and white? So there are a couple of things that are important about black and white. So first of all, you know, all this white is very reflective of heat energy. Um, and so to the black, is the opposite. It's going to absorb that heat. It's going to help this penguin stay warm as it's sitting on the ice. And um, you guys could test that out yourself. You've probably already done this. So in the middle of the summer, if you wanted to stay cool, you really wouldn't want to put on a black t-shirt. You'd prefer to have a white t-shirt on. And that's because that black just holds onto the heat. Whereas the white reflects it. So penguins are the same, but the opposite. They want that heat. So they're going to hold on to that color, that heat with their black coloring. In addition, um, the white on the underside and the black on the back is called counter shading. And it's a really cool trick in nature. So as this penguin goes into the water, if something is swimming up above it, it's not gonna see it very well because it'll blend in with the bottom of the ocean. But if something's swimming beneath it and looks up, it still won't see it because it's seeing the white, which is up against the light coloring. So it's a very important camouflage um, and it's not unique to Antarctica. There are many species that use counter shading. Um, a lot of fish species use it around the world, um, but certainly it's an important piece of the Antarctic uh, ecosystem. Um, and I wanna just point out, look at this gorgeous, beautiful white. I mean, this penguin is pristine, but they aren't always pristine. <laughs> So it's interesting to think about where in the heck did this penguin actually get so darn dirty? Because there really isn't soil or mud sitting around. There's ice and rock, right? So where in the heck is it collecting all of that filth? Well, it's actually uh, penguin poo. So it's guano and they are very messy. And when you're around a penguin colony, it can be a little bit smelly. Um, but they do like to lie down, obviously, when they're in these colonies. And as they lie down, of course, their bellies get just covered with this guano, um, which, you know, we might not think is all that exciting, but hey, it happens. <laughs> it's part of the natural world. All right. So why do you think these penguins are so high up? I mean, they're way off the water. Again, if you look at these penguins, you might be able to tell what kind they are. They have the black heads and no, you know, you can't see that little white on their eyes, but those are Adelis. Well, those guys are way high up in the water because they saw this guy in the near, near horizon. 
And this is uh, one of the top predators in Antarctica. It is, we've moved into a seal now. And some of you might recognize this seal. It has these interesting pattern all on its back and around its head. Um, it is called a leopard seal. And there's its head. Um, I am going to show you its mouth because that will tell you a little bit about why those penguins might wanna be away from this guy. Definitely a top predator. Um, it eats penguin, it eats seal, it eats fish, it eats crayon, it eats just about anything. Um, they are really uh, quite, quite aggressive as a hunter um, and everybody else stays away from them, including people, frankly, <laughs> they're, not, they're not friendly. Um, and it's not that they would think that they would go after a human per se, but they often mistake human for seal. So um, you have to be careful around them. This is a second type of penguin. I love this little guy. So this is a, a type of penguin called a crab eater. And I want you to think for a minute, what do you think a crab eater eats? And if you answered crab, you'd be wrong, <laughs> which is completely rid ridiculous, right? Um, but they were named by um, early whalers and early workers that came to Antarctica. And they, for some reason, thought that they ate crab, but they do not eat crab. Um, that is not their food at all. Um, what their food is, is this little krill. So I remember I told you we'd talk about krill in a minute. Um, this is an introduction to krill. They're about as big as my little finger. Uh, so two, two and a half inches or about uh, six centimeters or so. And um, they swarm in these very large groups. And we'll talk a little bit more about them in just a second. But what I want to focus in on, these are crab eater teeth. Look at how interesting they are. If we went to the dentist and we had teeth that looked like that, the dentist would say, are you kidding me? You have got problems. You've got cavities going everywhere. But this is actually how they're designed. And it's designed that way so that they can suck in the krill in between those teeny little holes. Isn't that it's amazing, right? Again, another very cool adaptation. These guys are, are quite, quite pretty, I think, and really kind of remarkable. Um, and so just to talk about Antarctic krill, there is a tremendous amount of Antarctic krill in the ocean. It is, if you've heard me talk so far, you've heard me say just about everything that we've talked about eats krill. That is a major part of the Antarctic food web. Um, I would say it's the base of the food web, although these guys actually eat plankton. So they'll actually eat off the ice, the floating ice, the sea ice. Um, plankton will uh, inhabit the base of the sea ice. And so these krill will eat off of that and then everything else kind of eats from the krill. And there are two, mil millions and tons of, of krill in the Antarctic Ocean. So they estimate that in the, the Southern Ocean alone, there's about 500 million tons of krill. That's insane. And if you took all the krill in the world, it would be twice, uh, twice as much as the number of humans in the world. So that gives you an idea of how much of it there is. Uh, but one thing that's kind of cool about krill that I want you to remember is that um, they're also interested in staying alive. So everything's interested in this balance of my life versus I'm either somebody's food or I'm looking for food. Um, and so they need to eat that plankton, but they're gonna try and do that at night because in the day they're very obvious and things will be coming down to eat them. And so one of their cool adaptations is they take these little legs, you see these little legs? And they stick them out and they make themselves like a parachute. So they slowly sink down lower in the water so that they're away from those things that are looking for food. And then they can come back up later in the day. So very, very cool, right? This idea that they can actually become parachute-like in the water and move up and down, amazing. All right, we're gonna look at another kind of, of a seal. This is our third kind. So this is the Waddell seal. This is quite a big seal. Um, and uh, look at that, I mean, totally takes over. So they like to, this is by the way, the Chinese station, the Great Wall station. And when we were there, you literally had to walk around these guys. Like they just lay where they lay and every, nobody bothers them. Um, they don't, they're one of the only seal actually that um, looks for ice to, to lay on. It, it doesn't seek out the rocks to warm. It just likes to lay around on the ice. So go figure. Um, and they're 
I have to bring them up close personal because they're just so incredible. They're quite large um, and they're, you know, very passive kind of seeming. They just kind of flop around. Um, they have a specific fish that they really like to eat. And that's the Antarctic fish, which is a very, very, very interesting fish. Um, it's the top fish really in Antarctica. Um, it has this cool feature where it has this antifreeze in the blood so that um, the blood doesn't uh, freeze as it swims around. And they're really large. So they grow to be six and a half feet, um, which is like over two meters. I mean, they're really huge. Um, and I'll just show you a picture of one of our Waddell seals having a little snack. Um, so, you know, this is one of their favorite things to eat. And um, he looks pretty content, don't you think? All right. Oh, and so what does this look like to you? Kind of looks a little bit like an elephant trunk, the way it's sitting, right? Um, but if we take a different shot, you'll see that it's actually a tail on a seal. And um, there's the face on that particular guy. And how sweet is that? So this is a uh, female elephant seal. And um, just so you get a better sense of how big they are, I'm going to show you a different view. And you'll see, this is the little penguin and this is the elephant seal. They are quite large um, and um, they tend to, to gather in groups. Um, there'll be a male that's called a bull and he'll have like a group of females around him that's kind of like they often refer to it as a harem. Um, this was from uh, part of the Thwaites research project uh, a couple of uh, summers ago. Um, and when I say summer, I mean Antarctic summer, which is actually about now. Um, so this is Dr. Um, Bohm, who is, they were doing some research where they were putting instruments on some of this, the seal's heads to collect some measurements. So I'll show you that in a second. Um, but in order to establish dominance, you have to make yourself a little bit bigger than this guy. So, and they're, you know, these are pretty good sized individuals. So again, he would go up and make himself taller to kind of get that, uh, elephant seal to back off a little bit and give them some respect. And um, you'll notice that this is this nose area is why they're called an elephant seal. They use it to kind of create this special mating call, which is different, interesting, right? Um, it's quite loud. Um, and so just to show you this, now this is not an elephant seal. Um, this is a Waddell, but again, this little instrument package is glued onto their heads. Um, it falls off. Um, when they molt, so they lose their fur annually. And so that package will fall off. So it doesn't hurt them. It's small enough compared to their body size. It doesn't slow them down, which is something you need to be aware of. You don't want to hurt their hunting ability. Um, but it allowed us to collect a lot of data about different uh, water properties in the, in the ocean. So temperature and salinity, uh, depth, It'll really, we learned a lot more from these little guys with these instruments um, than we did with our little robotics. They have different strengths and features. And if you're interested in that, there is an education sheet on that on the Thwaites Glacier website. So you can go there and, and learn about it. It's kind of cool. Um, so we know that our Antarctic seals die for their food. How deep do you think they die for their food? So let's take a peek. And think about this logically. So the leopard seal is the most aggressive. So it probably doesn't need to go super deep to uh, get a meal because it's not trying to avoid being eaten at the same time. So remember, they go in for food, but they don't want to be eaten. So they're kind of hanging out in this top tier. Um, this is just for reference. We're not going in there to get a meal. We're going in there just to show you how humans relate to these other natural species in the natural world. Um, Clearly we can get past the leopard seal, but we can't go as far down as a crab eater seal, which is this next guy. The Waddell goes almost twice as far as that. And then look at that elephant seal. That elephant seal can go way, way down. And it can go down and stay for up to two hours. Um, and one of the ways that it does that, it is, has this kind of odd blood quality where it has um, a high amount of carbon monoxide in their blood, which, you know, we hear that and think, oh, that's not good for us. And true for us, it's not. But for them, it actually slows down the amount of oxygen that they need uh, to, to breathe. And so it allows them to do those deep dives and stay down for that long period of time. So it has a benefit for them. All right. 
Um, this is one of my favorite pictures of Antarctica. Um, and I, I want you to just kind of look at it and then zoom in on this one little piece. If I can find my mouse, there it is. That is um, a, a team of our science group going into shore. So that was of scale. And one of the questions that came in was what was the, you know, that I was, was the most amazed by in Antarctica. It's the scale. It is massive. It's huge. Look at all that ice, just a solid wall of ice with a little bit of, of uh, rock showing. But all back here is more ice. And if you zoomed out, this is just ice going way back into it. Pretty incredible. Um, but what we were doing is going in to look at these little areas here. And I want to zoom in on those. This is an old whaling community. So in Antarctica, there used to be whaling as uh, an industry. And they actually, you can see these old whale bones there and their remnants are kind of the remains of some of these old buildings that they used to use to boil down the, the whale uh, blubber and get whale oil and stuff, which they used and shipped, um, which was in itself fairly dangerous because whale oil is very flammable. And so they had a lot of accidents. A lot of ships went down and they had to do rescues and um, sometimes it didn't go well and sometimes it did. Um, this is a ship, an old whaling vessel. This one went down, it's still there. It's been down there since the 1800s. Look at all that ice just kind of accumulated and dripping off of it. This crew was all rescued, so you don't need to worry about them. Um, but wow, it's amazing, right? To see that particular vessel and how much snow and ice has accumulated on it. Um, and here, of course, are the whales. So um, orcas are incredible. They are so, um, they're, they're wonderful swimmers. Uh, they're a top predator again. So they eat uh, penguins. So there are different types of orcas, by the way. And there are several types around Antarctica. Some of them eat only a minke, wha uh, minke whale. Uh, some of them are only interested in Antarctic toothfish. Um, but a lot of them will actually eat the seals, the penguins. Um, again, you know, it's eat or be eaten down there. So there's a lot of, um, you know, things that we might think are not so great, but it's part of nature. So thinking about, and I want, when we finish today, I want you to kind of measure this out at home or school, wherever you are. Um, the largest of these can be about nine and a half meters or 31 feet in length. So think about that. That is quite large. Um, and so when you're in those small boats that I showed you earlier of going ashore, those little Zodiacs, you think very carefully about how close you want to get to one of these guys because they can easily tip that boat um, and make your life pretty miserable. Okay, so we're going to do our second poll. And on this poll, I want you to think about who dives the deepest in the ocean? So we talked already about some of our um, seals, but now we're going to blend some things together. We're going to look at the elephant seal, again, those humans, Waddell seal, emperor penguin. We're going to throw in a penguin this time and those orcas. And let's see if you guys can um, give us some answers on that. And while you do that, I'm going to do a couple of my own shout outs. Um, I have a couple of nieces that are watching, Fiona and Samantha. And I have some grandkids that are watching, Harrison, Leo, and Logan. So I wanted to say hi to all of them, and I hope they're enjoying. So we'll see what you guys think. We'll give them another sort of 10 seconds or so. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Okay. And then I'll close, I'll end the polling. Okay. Can you see the results, Moggy? I can see the results. Okay, so there's a strong push for the elephant seal. I think that's amazing. Let's just see what we've got then in terms of what the answer is. So um, we'll see that the orca whale, again, thinking about those predators they that are uh, really strong predators, they tend to hang at the top. Humans again, and the emperor penguin below, Waddell seal, the emperor seals. But wait a second, I didn't even see pig. What the heck is a sea pig, guys? So what is a sea pig? Let's think about it for a minute. Um, do you think it has fins? Do you think it needs fins to be able to adapt? How about those colors that we like, those counter shading? Do you think it's black and white? 
you think it needs some kind of fur feathers to keep it warm? Like what, what do you think this sea pig might be? And again, thinking about a real pig, they like to be in the mud. You think this guy is gonna hang out kind of down at the bottom around the sediments? What do you think? Get himself all nice and muddy? Well, let's take a look. That is a sea pig. So really, really an interesting creature. Um, it's a type of sea cucumber. It's an verb. It's kind of a pink and a bit transparent. They're found all over the world's oceans. Um, and in the deep part of the ocean floor, um, they make up almost all of the, the mass of, of creatures. So 95%. So um, now you've seen a sea pig. You know exactly what they look like if someone asks. And so for my last slide, I just wanted to say, a lot of times people ask, were there dinosaurs in Antarctica? There were, there were dinosaurs found around every continent. This is not a dinosaur, but this is this uh, ancient aquatic a reptile that was recently discovered in 19, it was found in 1989, but it took them a long time to get the bones out from weather and it's, it's expensive and hard to get down there. Um, and it was found right off this little island here. So I know I'm running a little bit over, so we're gonna pop in and do questions. I'll stop sharing and we'll see where we are. Great. And I know there were a lot of questions that came in. I tried Great. to hit some of them as we were talking. There were a lot of questions, so we, we won't get through them all, but I will try and do some. I and mean, you, you did okay. try and weave things into your talk, which is good. And a lot, I think, were answered as you good. were talking. So, um, sort of like, you know, things like how many penguins there are in Antarctica and things like that. So, um, let's just uh, start here. I've got one actually from a school who's um, with us from Hawaii today. In the oh, Big cool. Island. And uh, the question from their students is, how do the penguins know if there's a shark or a killer whale underneath them when they go into the water? Ah, so you saw that they kind of put their heads down first to take a peek. So they look around to see if, um, you know, if they can see anything, but they don't always know. So again, you know, if it was foolproof, the shark, what, there actually aren't sharks down there, but whatever is down there would not have any food. So you have to think about it as a balance. Um, there's a, you know, the penguin are going to be food for something and vice versa. And I know that's hard for us sometimes to think about. Okay. Um, so if we go back to some of the questions, one of the questions that came in with the registration, mm -hmm. um, what would you say is the most resilient creature in Antarctica? Yeah, that is a really good question. And um, I think that, um, it's going to be something very small because that gives it the ability to kind of rebound and and uh, deal with things very easily. So, for example, uh, the krill that I showed you, those little teeny things, they can go 200 days without eating anything. So that's pretty incredible. And they're um, they have this kind of ability to cope with extremes. Um, but I will say that as the water temperatures warmed, they've had an invader come in. There's a, a, a salp that has come in that has started to replace the krill. So I'm not sure how that resilience will play out in a warming environment. I, I think that's yet to be uh, determined. There's one other creature that's down there. It's a tardigrad. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's like a water bear. And they have the ability to actually, they're called desiccate, like dewater, and then fill back up again. And they've also been around for quite a while. So I expect that they'll be fairly resilient. And there are a couple of questions actually that people have asked, and you talked about bigger um, wildlife and things, but a couple of questions about whether there are insects in Antarctica. Yeah, so the only native insect in Antarctica is this flightless midge. Um, and it's really the only thing that um, actually lives all the time on land. So it's kind of interesting, very, very small, like a centimeter in size, so super teeny. Um, there are a couple of others that have been, it, it, have come in. Um, so I think maybe the count is up to three or four at this point, but the flightless midge is the only one that's actually from Antarctica. Um, and we've got a question here from Nora who says, does anything eat the leopard seal? They're obviously the ones that are predators, but does anything eat them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So orcas will. Um, usually the younger leopard seals. So um, leopard seals have kind of one of those top perches. You know, there's always something that's kind of up at the top. Um, and that would be 
Yeah. So really only the young get eaten by the orcas, as far as my understanding is, I don't think that the adults are actually going to get eaten by those orcas. Um, I've got Leo, age five, who actually wants to know what your favorite animal is. Aha, uh -huh. that's a really good question. Um, and it's a hard one because they're all really special in, in their own way. I have to say, I not surprisingly, I just really love those penguins. And I'll tell you, the thing about the penguin is that, uh, especially, I have to say the Gen 2, they'll come right up to you in this very endearing way. They're not afraid of humans because we aren't allowed to do anything to them. So we have to actually try and hold back from them so we don't interact with them because we don't want to change their behavior. But they come right up to you as you kind of saw their little feet and then just like look at you. Like, who are you and what are you doing here? They're very curious. That's actually, it comes to one of the other questions that we've had about whether they, they a lot, look like from your photos, a lot of them are close to research bases and when they like to be near humans and whether they're they not. do. Yeah, they do. So the one where I showed you with the guano, that was the, I think that was Brown, which is the Arch Argentinian base. Um, and they all cluster around there. And then uh, also, I guess I showed you Port Lockeroy and they gather around there. But even when you're out on the ice doing something, um, if they're around, they'll come right up to you. They're very inquisitive, and, unless they're breeding. And if they're breeding, obviously they're gonna stay away and they're gonna be making that, you know, their mouths open, making the hooting noise saying, hey, get away. And um, Henry's asked actually whether the number of penguins are increasing or decreasing and whether the different species in their habitats, do they stay together or the colonies, do they stay apart or do they mix the colonies? Yeah, so you might remember in that map that um, there is a lot of activity up in the peninsula area. So the colonies do kind of get close together, but they tend to stay in their own colonies. Um, yes, there are winners and losers as temperature is changing. So um, there was a, a big uh, uh, bit of research that was done a few years back about how the Gen 2 are now uh, really getting more acclimated to being in Antarctica for longer periods of time and, and taking over in a lot of space where the Adelis used to be. And the Adelis numbers were dropping, not so much from the Gen 2s pushing into their space, but from the fact that the Adelis, it, it happens so fast, they don't have time to actually adapt to it. And so their behavior hasn't changed. So one of the things they do is they build their nests very low. And if it rains instead of snowing, which happens when it's warm out, um, their nests will flood and their eggs won't hatch. And so that's, that's been a, a kind of a sad reality that we've seen. Um, a bit of good news was that they discovered an entire island that was filled with Adelis um, more recently. And so the numbers weren't quite as dramatic in terms of loss as we'd expected. So that was a good piece, but we're certainly concerned about climate. Um. I've got a question here actually who's asked who's been asked have there been a penguin attacks to humans ah interesting I, I don't know that i know that i mean i know that penguins um will not want you in their space if they're in a breeding area and i expect at some point there probably was but i personally don't know the answer to that sorry <laughs> that's okay that's all right um christy has asked you know do the abandoned vessels do damage to the area so obviously you've got ships yeah. that have maybe Absolutely. washed up or have crashed? Yeah, it's such an interesting question. And I think we could ask that question about our own oceans. And if we leave things or if we pull them out, at a certain point, they become part of the habitat itself. So fish will move in and you know barnacles and different sea creatures will actually take up residence in some of these things. So it, it's, um, it's can, and in fact, you might have heard that they at some point built reefs out of old trains and kind of dropped them into the ocean to stabilize things. So uh, I don't suppose we would do that now. I don't suppose we would want to drop a ship in and abandon it. But now that it's there and it's become part of the background habitat, um, no, probably not. I mean, you saw that it's kind of rusting a bit, but rust ends up being iron and iron is a nutrient that ends up in the water and it all, you know, it's all dissipated through and used. Okay, and then I've got a hypothetical question for you here, actually. Hypothetically speaking, someone said, could a penguin, Isabel says, could a penguin colony survive in the Arctic and could polar bears survive in Antarctica? Wow. <laughs> 
That is a very fascinating question. Well, first of all, thank you for being aware that penguins are in the Antarctic and polar bears are in the Arctic and never the two shall meet. So that's a number one piece of information that I forgot to mention and I'm glad you did. Um, in terms of temperatures and habitats, so I guess hypothetically, I think that it's potentially possible. Um, polar bears spend a lot of their time on sea ice and there is a fair amount of sea ice in Antarctica. The, the trick is going to be that polar bears, in the Arctic, we have sea ice all year round. In Antarctica, there's less sea ice in the summer months. It actually, go, so in the Arctic, it's land surrounding an ocean. And so in Antarctica, it's land in the center. Did I say that backwards? In the Arctic, it's ocean surrounded by land. And so that land traps the sea ice. And in Antarctica, it's land surrounded by ocean. And so that sea ice tends to kind of move away. And so there might not be enough sea ice to actually support the polar bears who use it as a hunting platform and as a way to get around um, and get to different areas for food. So not 100% sure about that. Um, I would put my money more on the penguin being able to do okay, except of course predators. So yeah. good question though. That's a good thought one. Um, and Ben has asked, do sea, don't sea pigs, oh sorry, I don't know if it's actually, don't sea pigs live in colonies or is, is, do sea pigs live in colonies? So I don't know if you've got it. <laughs> no, the answer either way. I, I do not know about sea pigs. <laughs> I mean, their density is so large that um, I assume they, they kind of cover an area. I mean, I've seen them covering an area. In terms of whether we would call that a colony, I'm, I guess I'm not sure. That's a really good uh, question to kind of think about. I mean, when we say, you know, 95% of the deep ocean is covered, the deep ocean is a very massive uh, area. I mean, the ocean is huge. So the I, I don't know that they are like stacked on top of each other. I think that, you know, they're sp spread a bit. Um, but I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Okay. You don't have to know the answer to everything, Margie. No, thank goodness <laughs> for that, because I don't. And, you know, that's one of the great things about science is that, we're, that always, we're always we're always learning. We're always, you know, continuing to do stuff. And, so. and I also want to say thank you guys for asking all these questions, because that is science. It's about asking questions researching what we don't know, trying to set up a study to learn more. So you guys are all part of that, which is great. And this is actually, this ties in quite nicely with um, a question from Kaya, who says she's watching from New York, where you are. Oh, and, yeah. and she's um, wants to know how you get into studying Antarctica as wildlife. You know, whether yeah. it's topics that interest you. So. Yeah, it's a good question. So my background is in ecology and in ecology, we're looking at how, how different creatures uh, are adapted to their environment. So how do they work in their environment, which I tried to focus on quite a bit as I talked about these unique adaptations these creatures had. Um, in terms of, um, I actually studied marshes, salt marshes. So I didn't start out in thinking about Antarctic ecology at all. It was more about, um, I fell into that opportunity. And I think you would find that a lot of our Antarctic scientists actually moved, have studied broadly in a variety of ways and just managed to end up in an area where they um, could take advantage of studying these unique areas. I happen to work in a polar, what we call a polar geophysics group, where we focus on icy areas in both poles. So it gives me a chance to kind of dabble in both areas, which is very cool. Okay, so we're coming actually to the top of our hour We're already. Um, I'm just gonna see if I can find one here just to finish with about uh, what surprised you most about Antarctica on your trips there? Yeah, so it is so vast and so quiet. So, I mean, aside from, you know, when you hear a school, obviously I mentioned to you, they're really loud, but in terms of just the stillness and the vastness of it, I, I don't think you can do it justice, even in that one picture where I tried to show you that little teeny vessel in that huge space, I mean, it is incredible. And the fact that, you know, it's, it's bigger than, it's like one and a half times the size of the US and goodness, UK, there must be multiple UKs that could fit into it. It's just an incredibly vast space that is pristine and beautiful. I don't know, that's all I can say, amazing. Great. Well, I think we'll have to leave it there actually, unfortunately. But thank you for everyone for all the questions that you you know you submit. It's 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 been a wonderful 
sort of response to all of our talks this week. So I hope that'll continue for the rest of the week. And um, please do come back and join us for the next, the last two days. And thank you, Margie, for joining us and giving us a little flavor of different wildlife. So. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.